Hey everyone, so in this video we're going to be talking about online law schools, whether or not it's something that's worth it, whether or not it's something that you should actually consider for your career. Now for those of you who have already been doing some research, you've probably come across a lot of international law schools as well as a lot of domestic law schools, particularly based in the California region, that are being offered online. And so you've probably looked at these opportunities and you thought whether, you know, is it something that's going to add value to your career or whether or not it's something that you should kind of bypass and go down the traditional route. Now, over the past five to ten years, we've seen a massive emergence in online and distance education learning. We've seen engineering faculties come online, social science faculty, science faculties, but what we haven't seen is a whole lot of action from the legal field. And there's actually a great reason for this. One of the biggest reasons is the fact that many of the bar associations will require that students obtain either all of the education or the majority of the education, a high majority of the education, through on-campus instruction. And so that's the reason why we haven't seen any ABA accredited American-based online law degrees offered completely online. We have seen, however, a few ABA accredited schools, and, and most famously, Syracuse University has recently announced that they're going to be offering a few courses through distance education, but still the primary method of instruction is going to be on campus. So with that said, a lot of people who cannot obtain a law degree from an on-campus program or an ABA accredited program, for whatever reason, are looking to a lot of these distance education programs as kind of an alternative. Now, the problem with this is there's three things that are going to determine whether or not somebody can actually practice law. Number one is where is the law school located? Number two, where's the student located? And number three, where does a student want to practice law? And why this is important is because if somebody is obtaining an online degree in law from an international school, as an example, they're probably going to learn the curriculum and the laws that pertain to the jurisdiction where the law school is located. And this would obviously make sense. Now, the problem with this is the fact that with somebody who's looking to practice in a different country or a completely different ju jurisdiction, when they're looking to sit for the bar exam, they might have discrepancies between the curriculum that they received and the curriculum that they actually need to be able to even sit for the bar exam. The other issue is depending on the jurisdiction, if they have restrictions against online education, they might not even be able to sit for the bar exam even if the curriculum meets the requirements. So for this reason, those are two massive barriers to entry. Let's assume that somebody can get past all of this. There still might be situations where some students will need to go to a domestic law school to learn a lot of the US-based law that is going to pertain to the jurisdiction that they want to practice in. So these are already major red flags that, that could take somebody much longer than what would take them if they were to go to a domestic law school. Now let's assume that they can get past these barriers as well, and they can get to the bar exam, they can pass the bar exam, They let's say they can even secure an articling position. The other issue they're going to face is the fact that the law profession in general tends to really look at where the student went to school, what rank that school is, and where they ranked within that class as well. And so they're going to find that they're at a massive disadvantage to their counterparts domestically who went to recognizable big name schools, in some cases T14 schools, and have graduated um, maybe within the top of their class or a top percentage within their class as well. Given the fact that law schools are producing so many law graduates, the law field in general, particularly in the United States, is very, very saturated at the moment. And so for this reason, it's already hard enough to secure employment, particularly at big law firms, even for people who have graduated from domestic recognizable programs. I can't imagine how much more difficult it's going to be for people who are obtaining degrees from an online program that isn't accredited and might not even meet the educational requirements to make them competitive for that specific type of law. The other thing to really consider is the fact that law is one of those interesting fields where the compensation discrepancies are massive for people depending on where they're practicing law, where in the United States they're practicing law even, the type of law that they're practicing, and whether or not they're working at a very small family office or a big law firm uh, that's nationwide or international, internationally based as well. So for this reason, a lot of people go into law school and be okay with the fact that they might be taking out a large amount of debt 
um, because they assume that they're going to fall into a profession that's going to pay them at least six figures and maybe they'll get down the partner track and they'll be making tons of money 10 to 15 years into the future. Well, the problem with a lot of these online programs is the fact that a lot of cases they cost just as much, in some cases even more, than on-campus counterparts that are ABA accredited and recognized, which is going to give somebody the burden of having all of this debt, but not the employment prospects that they would get going into a program that's a lot more um, recognized uh, domestically. And so what happens in these situations? Well, a lot of students will come out of these programs, feel as though their employment prospects are bleak, and will have to leave the legal profession entirely, which is extremely unfortunate. And so let's take the opposite approach to this right now. Like, let's look at the other side of the coin for a second and say, well, why would anyone ever look at an online law school? Like, when does it make sense? When should somebody actually consider an online law degree? Well, I would say that there's almost, in my opinion, um, very few instances where this would make sense, um, if any at all. But the one instance where I, I could see it potentially making sense for some people would be if somebody is 100% sure, absolutely for sure, that they want to be an attorney, a freelance attorney, and work for themselves. And so in other words, they're not necessarily having to work for uh, a law firm or work for a family office. And so they want to maybe just graduate and be able to be a freelance attorney and provide legal services under their own name um, as kind of a solo attorney, so to speak. Now, this is uh, an okay route, but the reason why they can pursue this route is the fact that clients in a lot of cases won't necessarily look at where the attorney maybe went to school as much as a potential employer is going to look at that. In a lot of cases, clients are more so considered or considering what cases have they worked on, what skills do they have, what's their track record look like. And those are going to be things that are much more important to the client, whereas employers might also really be interested in these things, but also want to look at what's their legal training in, what skills do they actually bring, do we, are we familiar with these programs? Do we know a whole lot about the program that they actually came from? And so it's going to be something that's much more important at that stage. So if somebody wants to go down the freelance attorney route, the this is a very, very risky route, first of all. Um, it's essentially going down the small business route because essentially what that person is doing is they're creating a small business for themselves. They're being a consultant. They're providing legal services to the public or to businesses or whoever else they're providing it to, but they're essentially doing what a, ma a freelance management consultant would do in that they're providing management services to the public. And so the problem with this route is that somebody who's coming out of law school, who just came out of their articling position, who's just starting their new freelance online online, uh, not online, but like, you know, legal practice, they're not even given the opportunity to practice law on a full-time basis because they have to worry about things like business development, accounting, managing the actual business, advertising, and all the other things that come along with running an online business while they're still trying to get their feet wet as an attorney. Now equip this with the fact that they might have some tremendous amount of debts leaming over them. This might put them in a completely terrible position as a new attorney. And this might actually completely de deter how they're going to direct their law career and whether or not they can actually stay within the practice as well. This might make sense for people who are very confident in the fact that they already have a client base established for them or that they'll have no problems getting clients at all for whatever reason given their specific background. But for many people, this is gonna be an extremely risky route to go down. So I hope I've provided you with some information. Um, if you've attended an online law school or if you've thought about it, I'd love to hear your comments, questions, concerns in the comments section below. If you've done any research on your own, I'd also love to hear about that as well. Again, thank you so much for watching. Really do appreciate it. And until next time, we'll see you in the next one.